Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I hope you are all doing very well today. Continuing with my discussion of a particular work by Jacques Rivette, it is my pleasure to talk with you today, if I may, about episode two, deuxième episode, which is entitled De Thomas à Frédéric. And of course, this is episode two of Out One, Noli Me Tangere. So as I have mentioned previously, this will be a discussion of episode two, deuxième episode of Out One Noli Me Tangere. I will be referencing where necessary and where appropriate certain events that occurred in the first episode, uh, the Lili Atoma. And then of course I will be focusing on the events that occurred in the second episode de Thomas à Frédéric. I will not be making any direct mentionings of anything that happens in any subsequent episode, so uh, I will be focusing on this episode primarily. If I need to make any reference to any future episode, I will do so as vaguely as possible to avoid spoiling it for you. So. You don't have to have necessarily seen the entirety of Out One Noli Me but I do uh, urge you to watch episode one and episode two prior to watching this video because I will be talking about specific details about those two episodes, in particular episode two, which is the focus of today's video. Once again, uh, this is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion. So I don't want to spoil it for you because this is a really great and fascinating work. So uh, without further ado, my friends, let us now talk about Dizium episode of Out One, Noli Mi Tangere. Okay, so you're back. So this is uh, very interesting because we should start with the title. Okay, The title, as given in the opening credit sequence, is the Thomas à Frédéric. So this is interesting. From Thomas to Frédéric. As of now, we are not sure who f this Frédéric is, but uh, suffice to say that we will probably get an understanding of who Frédéric is as we progress through the episode. But for now, let us start with Thomas. So Thomas is, as we recall, the actor he apparently is the leader or the director or uh, the lead head actor, if you will, of the acting troupe that is currently uh, working on Prometheus Bound. So, uh, and he's uh, Michael Lonsdale. So that is the Thomas of uh, From Thomas to Frédéric. That is the uh, situation. Now remember also, which is very interesting, the title of the previous episode first episode was De Lily à Thomas, from Lily to Thomas. And then the second episode is From Thomas to Frédéric. So the name that appears in the second half of the title of the preceding episode then appears in the first half of the title of the current episode. So perhaps when we get to the third episode, we should keep an eye out as to what the title of that episode will be. So right now, let's keep in, uh, keep in mind that the title of this current second episode is De Thomas à Frédéric. So from Thomas to Frédéric. So let's keep in mind the name of Frédéric uh, when we talk about this episode and then when we think about what the title of the third episode will be in a future video. Okay. Then what we have is very interesting, right? Because we start with something that is a little bit different. We didn't see this in the first episode. We start with black and white images. They seem to be photographs 
And on the soundtrack, we get the sort of bongo drum, beatnik type of uh, music. And the music, if you recall, is I understand it to be the music that was played on the record player at the very start of the first episode when the the acting troupe that is headed by Lily and they are doing uh, Seven Against Thebes. They are doing their uh, stretches and warm-up exercises, and they're playing that that drum beat sort of music. Well, the same music is being played over these montage of black and white photographs, which is incredibly interesting. Now, we look carefully at the black and white photographs, and we can see that they appear to be images that are supposed to represent scenes from the preceding episode. So we see, for instance, the uh, the, the uh, introductory scene in the first episode regarding the Seven Against Thebes and uh, that little uh, bit of improvisational uh, vigor that was expressed early on between Quentin and um, Arsenal, Nicolas, Theo, Papa. And uh, we also see pictures of Lily, and we also see pictures of, of, um, of uh, Thomas, and that other second acting troupe with Beatrice, Bergamot, and Achille, and Fawn, and uh, Rose. And then we also see uh, quick images of the uh, La Jeune Voleuse, the young thief, the young woman who is a thief. And we also see images of the, the young man who is described as being deaf and mute. So these are very interesting images. So these are meant, I think, to recall the previous episode scenes uh, in general, this, not quite the same order, but generally speaking, it's more or less in, the, in roughly the same order as the scenes they appeared in the, pre, uh, the first episode. But look carefully. This is a very interesting point that I want to bring up. The pictures that we see at the very outset in this black and white montage are not exactly the precise images of the episode. They seem to be photographs that are taken, maybe they feel like different versions of the scene, or they feel like, oh, they feel almost like um, uh, uh, sort of onset camera footage. You, you know, some people take photographs of a film as it progresses. So it feels like they're not exactly uh, exact replicas of the shots that we saw in the, in the first episode, but they're rather taken from different angles slightly and I would dare say also that there are instances where the the actual photographs that are used don't match up directly with the scenes of the first episode I'll give you two examples first example when we see the seven against Thebes group please look carefully at the very outset when we see the group of them doing their warm-up routine at the very beginning when they're rolling their heads remember there's a picture that appears at the, the beginning of this montage where we see the character of Arsenal. And uh, please forgive me, you know, I think I, I called him Arsenal. Um, uh, I, I sh I, you know, um, in the earlier video, I meant to say Arsenal, but I think I called him Arsene, so that was my mistake. But uh, the character of Arsenal is, uh, he has also called Nicolas and Theo and Papa, but the character of Arsenal is shown wearing a, I think, a brown or dark sweater over his large white shirt. Well, if you recall in the pr first episode, he's not actually seen wearing a brown sweater. He's seen only wearing his large white blouse of a shirt. So the picture that we see at the very beginning of uh, the second episode with that respect to that particular moment in the first episode is not the same version. It's a slightly different version, uh, which is interesting. So it, it, that to me lends itself very nicely to this idea of backstage photograph shooting, this idea of, of uh, a kind of art being displayed, uh, work in progress sort of feel to it, uh, not quite fitting into what exactly happens. So there is a little bit of unease that's generated immediately. There is a certain doubt that is generated in my mind. Am I really remembering exactly uh, as it happened? Or is my memory a little bit off? So these sorts of doubts start to seep in, I think quite uh, subconsciously. 
in a way that's really brilliant. So I, I love this this sense of, of unease that's generated immediately, uh, as well as the montage being, of course, as a narrative tool, a, a really great way of, of, of providing a bit of catch up uh, for a viewer in order to re give us an idea of what happened before. You know, this happens a lot. So uh, in, in the context of, uh, of, let's say, network television. So. Uh, this is a great tool. But another example that I would draw your attention to is look carefully at the pictures of the Jean-Pierre Leo character. You know, he plays the, the, the man, the young man who has the harmonica thing and he hands out the messages, right? And he is described as being deaf and mute. Well, look carefully and you'll notice that the pictures that are used of the of that particular character there are two photographs if i'm not mistaken both photographs are actually not of scenes that were shown in the first episode he is seen standing over uh two women the first picture is showing him standing over a, a slightly elderly woman with a short haircut and glasses and then the second picture is him standing over a, a woman who has long maybe blondish hair maybe uh, to around this length of her hair and and we see her the back of her head well we never saw a scene like that taking place in the first episode at least as far as i i remember but what's interesting is we actually see Jean-Pierre Leo's character enter into a cafe in the second episode and we actually see him uh, interacting with a number of people included in which is an elderly lady who looks so similar to the woman that is first featured in the montage of photographs here. So in fact I would dare say that perhaps what we are seeing in the montage at the start of this episode, uh, we are seeing not photographs that recall the first episode with respect to the Jean-Pierre Leo character, but in fact, we're seeing photographs that I think represent things that will happen in this current episode. I think at the same time, the photographs are meant to recall the past episode because those scenes are very similar. Right. In both instances, we have the Jean-Pierre Leo, Leo character walk into a cafe unannounced and do his thing. So uh, I, I can see why it, maybe people might think that that picture is of the first episode, whereas in fact it's actually the second episode, I think. So that is a very interesting thing indeed. It goes, I think, also very subliminally to the fact that there is some playfulness that is being had here regarding a kind of temporal playfulness. What we are seeing is not necessarily of the past, but it will be of the future. And so we are already getting a hint of some possibility of playing with time in the context of Out One. And this is already, this is not even the, the Right? We haven't even gotten into the drama of the, of the, the episode proper. We've just get, getting into the, um, the montage of pictures. So, but already there's much to think about in this montage as we go forward. But um, Okay, so then we go into the, the last segment of the first episode in black and white, which is, if you recall, a, a lovely shot, which uh, then we see the young thief, the uh, Unjeun Boulouz sitting alone in her room pulling out a gun from her bag and then we cut to a color sequence which is of the streets of Paris and the loud uh, traffic noises and then we are underway so this is now the start of the second episode with the color sequences so what can we make of the second episode as we go through this okay so let's then uh, f move on with our discussion and let's try to keep it in the context of the four main components of characters uh, that we talked about in the last YouTube video. So the first place I think we can start is the, the group, the first character component that is comprised of the, of the, the acting troupe that is focusing on Promethe Prometheus Bound. And right away we see them sitting around on the floor uh, looking at pictures or books or something like that and and what we find is that they are trying to rely upon uh, poetry or uh, uh, certain works of literature or certain pictures of art uh, something of that nature in order to try to get them inspired to start to talk about 
the character of Prometheus, at least as they understand that character to be in the context of the play Prometheus Bound. And we see also a, a microphone in the center as they are speaking. So I think we are meant to understand that this is in fact one of the exercises of trying to to reconcile the notion of action and dialogue. This is one of the exercises that I think was proposed by Achille and also by Thomas at the end of the first episode when they were sitting around in the first episode and they were talking, if you recall, about how the actors were finding it difficult to reconcile their actions with the text of the play. And so I think it was Achille who first proposed that they try to develop some kind of exercises in order to try to find a way of articulating their improvisational instincts with some kind of words that would be consistent with the spirit of the play Prometheus Bound. And so I think this is what we see at the outset of the, the second episode. And in fact, that I think is represented by the fact that their discussions are being recorded by Achille, no less. Although I should point out that it, even though it was Achille who I think proposed it at first to have this sort of exercise, uh, he uh, messes up because he got the tape uh, put in wrong. And so he was not able to record the entirety of the discussion by Rose and um, I think a little bit by, uh, by Thomas, uh, which is a shame. Uh, but in any event, it was he who proposed it, but he messed it up. So uh, I don't know if that's any indication of, it, of the kind of character that he is, but it's something to keep in mind, I suppose. Um, but then we then get into their discussions and their focus on uh, their impressions of uh, Prometheus or what they think uh, is helping them to try to get a better grasp of what they think Prometheus is or what it represents or what he represents. And then uh, is trying to speak in the name of Prometheus. In, order, in other words, they're trying to get, dig deep down and trying to uh, become inspired to speak in the words of Prometheus uh, for whatever that's worth. Now, <clears throat> I would note here that this seems to be, again, another actor exercise that uh, might seem a little bit um, might seem a little bit uh, foreign to uh, people like myself who, again, are not familiar with acting methods in the theater. But I think uh, maybe despite my own uh, inability to fully comprehend this kind of method, I think I can take away from this at least a couple of very general things that might be very helpful for me going forward. Uh, the first is we see this group dynamic. And if you recall, there is, uh, I think we can see here, seeds of discontent or discord, not explicitly shown, but they are sort of layered in there, rather nuanced and quite quietly, I think. Remember, they are talking, trying to get inspired as to what Prometheus would say. Uh, there's that great, for example, Thomas asks Rose, you know, if Rose had to articulate the line of Prometheus, you know, don't think that I am silent uh, due to pride or stubbornness. If, if he asks her to say that line or express that line in terms of, of modern day speech. And so, um, uh, uh, She's trying to express this, and uh, but uh, there is a little bit of, of difficulty. And in fact, there is even more difficulty that's being uh, expressed by the other character there, Bergamote, and also Fawn, the, the young lady with the red hair, and also by uh, Beatrice, who's sitting next to um, Thomas. And so Thomas is trying to encourage them to speak in the name of Prometheus, but it's, there's a little bit of difficulty there. And in fact, it ends with the suggestion, I think it's by Rose or Bergamota, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's Rose who suggests that perhaps if we are speaking in our own tongue, as it were, in our own words, the words of Prometheus, then what is the point of doing the play Prometheus Bound? We might as well do our own play which I think is, in its own subtle way, a kind of almost maybe an unintentional act of rebellion, but still, I think, an act of rebellion all the same against Thomas. At least it can be interpreted that way. And so that seems to suggest to me a, a seed of discord. There is a certain trouble. Um, again, it's not overt, it's not explicit, but it, it's there. It's not smooth sailing. And I think this creates a, a nice dramatic dynamic 
between or among the characters here, Toma on one hand and the, the actors on the other, and they're trying to reconcile what it is that they are, uh, they are going through here. And I think, yes, there is a sense of discord, albeit very slight, very faint. So uh, let's keep that in mind as you progress through the rest of Out One. But uh, this is very interesting. So that's one generality I can take from this scene. The other generality I can take from this particular scene is the way it's intercut with the shots of street uh, life Paris during the daytime. And we see the young thief, uh, La Jeune Voleuse, who's played by Juliette Berthaud. And so we see her walking through the streets of Paris. And then we see shots of traffic and we go back to the, the acting troupe and we go randomly, seemingly randomly, back to the streets and then back to the troupe, which is a very interesting juxtaposition. It seems to be random, but I think if we wanted to, we could try to interpret this juxtaposition of editing as being some kind of signifier of some deeper meaning, or we could just brush it off as being just a, a means by which the episode is trying to to uh, provide information. One of the two, it's really up to you. Or it could be just a random editing exercise. It could be one of those, it really is up to you. But if you are in the camp that wants to try to infuse some meaning to the seemingly madness of random editing, then perhaps one thing I could propose as a possible possibility would be that uh, there is this sense that the group, they're sitting around, right, and they're looking at uh, art, and they're talking about high literature and all this stuff. And they are talking about Prometheus, you know, the creation of man, and, uh, you know, the ungratefulness of man, and, and, and all this stuff, right? While then we get uh, edits back to the streets of Paris, and the young woman, right? And so it seems to me like there is almost like a uh, a metaphorical image that's being created, perhaps unintentionally, but it's being created all the same, at least in my mind, at least as a potential interpretation, that these actors are almost like on the level of the gods, right? And then we have the the humans uh, being represented by the shots of uh, quick shots of Paris as we see them, and who is there in the center of the human uh, shots? Why it's the young woman that we saw from the first episode, and so there seems to be almost uh, uh, quite subconsciously a, a kind of divide. Maybe you could call it even a class divide. I'm not sure if we can go that far quite yet, but there seems to be a, a divide that is already taking place between these actors that are sitting around, almost playing with, uh, playing with clay like Prometheus would, perhaps, and then cutting quite rapidly to the shots of Paris, the, the actual ground level, if you will, of Earth. So, so th that, that feels like some kind of uh, 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 interplay between image uh, or between two seemingly disparate groups of characters. Okay? Uh, so that's, I think, something that uh, might be something that one could possibly chew on. Who knows? But um, Okay, so that's the first part of this one character component. Um, but then let's take let's go that next step and let's go to the second character component which is the young thief this young woman that we saw in the first episode albeit very briefly we see more of her in this episode and i think we get revelations about her almost immediately we see her interacting with three young men in a cafe she then talks about her background, at least how she, she says she has a, a, a young child, and she is trying to get into the good graces of this, this the conversation between these three men who are talking about Africa and jobs and, and something like that. It's, it's quite difficult to follow, actually. But I think the point here is that we see the young woman presenting a different story than the one that she presented to the young man, um, un faux celibataire, that we saw at the the tail end of the first episode, remember, with the hands up and the mirror. So it's almost like she's giving, right, different stories depending on who she's talking to. And we realize that she is a swindler and she's trying to swindle some kind of money out of them. And she does, she does succeed uh, to get, uh, at least uh, as she describes it, a lot of money from these, these 
uh, people. And then she walks away. But then we see her interact with a, a man at the bar who has a dog. And we understand that this man, his name is Honeymoon. And he's drinking what I think is being described as uh, grenadine syrup milk, which has that uh, pink color to it. Uh, and they have a very warm conversation. And it's during this conversation that he calls her Frédéric. So yes, we finally get her name. It's Frédéric. And in fact, that is how she is called in the end credits. She is labeled as Frédéric, or she is called Frédéric. So this is the Frédéric of the title, de Thomas à Frédéric, that we saw at the outset of the, um, the, the starting credits of uh, the second episode. So she is the Frédéric of the title of this episode. And she has uh, so much... Uh, um, uh, she she is a really interesting character, uh, quite vivacious, and she's um, uh, she seems to be very tough, and she's a swindler, and she's trying to uh, basically swindle people out of their money. Uh, but she has a sort of soft side, if you will, when she's talking to Honeymoon. She really seems to like Honeymoon, uh, this this man at the bar, and in fact, uh, Honeymoon is. Um, is played by Michel Berthaud, right? So uh, they have a really good rapport, I think, both on and off the screen, and you can really tell. And uh, the conversation that she has about his dog, Sweetie, is it uh, un chien or un chien? It's un chien. Of course, it must be. Yes. So um, it's uh, th those sorts of moments, I think, are quite charming and lovely. And so this this is a way in, so to speak, for us, for me, the viewer, to begin to. Uh, sympathize with her situation, her plight, uh, her story, and so, uh, and we spend uh, more time with her. Uh, it, there's an interesting little thing that happens, right? She is talking with the men, the three men, and then they give her the money, and then she goes, and it cuts immediately to her meeting honeymoon at the bar. So the cut seems to imply that that whole thing with the three men happened in the same location as the when she's meeting with honeymoon at the at the bar. Um, and so it, that the implication is that it happens really quickly. Um, and then she's talking and then she remember she gives him some money because uh, remember he is he seems to be a bit down because he's talking about uh, someone that he is infatuated with, but he is probably not getting um, the same sort of uh, feelings in reciprocation. But also, there is some story about how he was uh, he wanted a, a uh, I think it was a piece of jewelry or something, and uh, from uh, a past story, as it were. And so she gives him some money to get what he wanted, and he says, oh, "I'll pay you back" or something like that. So he she is giving him some money, which we assume is part of the money that she got from the three men. I'm not quite sure about that, but at th this is the stage of the story where she is very, um, uh, she's on a high because she just, you know, she was able to get this huge score, as it were. And then she uh, is um, ecstatic, and so she uh, gives some money to Honeymoon. Well, then when she leaves, we see her outside and she says, um, you know, I've lost it. Um, I've lost it. And the assumption that we understand later um, uh, to mean that she lost her money. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always wondered what this meant. How did she lose the money in such a short space? Is it possible that the, the edit between the three men conversation and her encounter with Honeymoon, that hard edit, maybe it should be more suggestive of a large passage of time and space, who knows. But if it's not, and if it's occupying the same space, or it's meant to occupy the same space, then we are then supposed to understand that immediately after she pocketed the money from the three men, she immediately sees Honeymoon, and that the money is apparently in her bag. Honeymoon isn't seen actually rummin you know, looking through her bag, so it couldn't have been Honeymoon who took the money. We don't see anyone approach the bag, so we don't know what happens. All we know is that she gives him some money, and then she leaves, and then she says, oh, darn it, I lost it. So how did she lose the money in that short space of time? It's a, kind of a mystery to me. I mean, one possibility, I suppose, is that she got so carried away 
with her uh, ecstasy, as it were, that she gave the entirety of the money that she got. She gave that to Honeymoon. And so, uh, but Honeyman didn't know the exact number of uh, the exact amount that she got. So how is he supposed to know that what he received was in fact the entirety of, of the money that she received? Who knows? But one possibility I could see is that maybe she gave, without knowing it, the entirety of the money to him. And then when she left the cafe and she realizes that she doesn't have any money, she interprets that situation to mean that she lost the money. And in fact, later when she meets Honeymoon again, uh, he refers to the fact that, oh, so you lost the money. So uh, I think the understanding or that they interpret the situation to mean that she lost money. But it's not clear exactly how she lost it. Or maybe it was a magic trick. Who knows? I'm not sure. But uh, that's a little mystery that um, I don't think is solved within the confines of this little episode. Uh, but uh, then we go into more details with her and Honeymoon, and we see her interact with other people. The uh, the two uh, they're called uh, pornographers in um, in the credit because uh, based on information received by Honeymoon, they are two pornographers that apparently have this scheme where they sell news papers, uh, religious newspapers, but in fact the newspapers have in the inner pages uh, pornographic pictures, or at least that's the assumption. And so she goes to these two and tries to um, extort something from them, some money, but then she is thrown out by the waiter. She is trying to do some right deed, but then she, it is she who is thrown out. So, um, and then we see her uh, alone in her apartment during uh, before and after these events we see her with a little dummy uh, doll um, you know Harlequin and his shop and then also we see her later alone in her room counting uh, rather randomly it seems and also all nonsensically although and she's wandering her room alone and counting all the way from um, um, I think I want to say um, um, 40, what was it uh, 40, 15, I think, to all the way down to zero. And then when she reaches zero, she repeats zero, and then that's it, nothing. She's alone. So it's interesting, this character uh, of Frédéric, she seems to be very independent-willed, very uh, uh, independent-spirited, and yet when she is alone, she seems to exhibit these moments where she almost... Uh, it's like a regression back to some kind of form of childhood, if you will, playing with dolls by herself, doing a little bit of a hide-and-seek game by herself. But the end result of that hide-and-seek game is that zero, zero, nothing. She is alone. And I think this is uh, this engenders a sense of, of strong sympathy on my part towards her. And uh, it, it's a really a powerful moment, I think, in terms of acting. It, it's basically acting out, uh, creating magic out of nothing, out of thin air. And uh, that moment in particular, the, the sequence where she is wandering the room by herself and doing that nonsensical counting down is really a, a, a profoundly moving moment, I think. And uh, this is a character that I think we will be meant to follow as the episodes progress. And in fact, we will. So Frédéric, is going to be a very important character. And then let's go to the next component of this, which is um, uh, the, um, let's go to the, the next acting troupe. So the acting troupe that we have, this, uh, that we saw in the first episode is still here. This is Lily and, uh, Lily and Quentin and, um, here, here he is. Uh, the end credits give him the name of Nicolas only, and also there's Marie and there is Hélène. Now we see them in various stages, and this is very interesting. What I would urge you to do is take a look at their clothing. Take a look at their clothing when you see this episode, because their clothing doesn't quite match. What do I mean by this? The first time I think. We see um, what I'm not the first time. What one of the early times that we see um, the uh, the troop is uh, well. One of the earlier scenes is when we see Lily and Ellen together alone, sitting maybe in a cafe outside or a table outside, and this is where we get the discussion of Georges 
who is apparently, I think we can assume, is a friend or a boyfriend of Lily. We haven't seen George, but she speaks about George and some kind of suspicious thing that he did. You know, when she came home on separate occasions, he was, he was on the phone and he hung up as though he wanted not to be on the phone when she was there. And so uh, she is talking about some kind of mysterious things that George is doing. And she's confiding this to Elaine. Before I get any further, please note their dress, their fashion. Because, for instance, uh, Lily is wearing like, like a black or dark sweater. And Elaine is wearing, I think, a, a, a yellowish sweater dress, I think. This, of course doesn't match the wardrobe that we saw them wearing in the first episode. Um, but uh, it's interesting, too, because right after the sequence, we see a shot of the troupe rehearsing a particular scene from Seven Against Themes, and they're wearing the same clothes that they were wearing in the first episode. But it's odd because... If that's the case, then the fact that they're wearing the same clothes in that scene that occurs after the scene with the two of them outside and they're wearing different clothes seems to suggest that the scene that came after this scene should have come before. You know, So there is, I think, just based on the way, what they're wearing, we might assume that there is some kind of playing with time uh, that is indicated with uh, um, the way in which the scenes are presented vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Lily story. I think this is made even further complicated by the fact that we will see actually later when Lily and the acting troupe come into the theater for the first time wearing those, you know, um, it's Marie wearing that purplish, uh, purplish get-up, uh, Hélène, as I said, wearing that uh, uh, yellow sweater dress, um, Lily wearing that black sweater. So I assume that they're wearing different clothes. So this is, I assume that that might mean that this is the day after the first episode. Who knows? But what makes it confusing is that we see Lily getting dressed and she dresses, she takes off her, her black sweater and she gets into the pink leotard top and then the white striped tank top. So this is matching the exact same wardrobe that she wore in the first episode. So her wardrobe <laughs> matches uh, the first episode's wardrobe, but I don't know if the wardrobe of the other characters matches what they were wearing in the previous episode. An example being Quentin. I don't think what he he wore like a, a vest in the first episode, but that's that's nowhere uh, present in at least those small snippets of scenes that we saw of him in the second episode. And so, um, my sense is that, for instance, uh, yes, so. Uh, Let's take also the character of Marie. You know, Marie is seen in the first episode with the turquoise bandana around her head and the, the brown pants, I think. And then in the second episode, she's seen with her purple getup and the purple stockings. And so my understanding is from Marie, you know, the turquoise band is when that was the first day. And then the second day is when she's wearing this purplish getup, although I'm not quite sure. Again, time is something that is a little bit confused here uh, or it's confusing to me. And it's not even, I think, uh, anything of, of direct narrative significance necessarily, but it's all the same, quite fascinating. The more we tune into these details, the more we realize that there is so much playfulness going on um, within the mise-en-scene itself. It's really fascinating. But um, let's now go back. I'm sorry for the digression, but now going back to this conversation between um, uh, Hélène and uh, Lily, where we get a reference this very mysterious reference to Georges, who is Georges, and how he reacted uh, with the phone. And then we get these things about, oh, Georges is involved in a child abduction case, which is said by Hélène, which is really randomly, it seems to be out of the blue. I don't even know what's going on at this point. But then we realize later, with the introduction of another character, whose name is Lucy, we see at the very end of the episode, we realize that perhaps Georges has something to do with the law. Maybe he is a lawyer or an attorney. That's why he seems to know Lucy, or Lucy seems to know her, him. 
And so that might explain the, that line that Hélène says, that he is in, involved in a child abduction case. Maybe that's some a current case that he's working at, on as an attorney. Who knows? But um, Hélène seems to have some kind of connection to Georges, which seems to uh, be the reason why Lily is confiding in Hélène. And remember, here is also a very important point. This is where we see Lily say, ask Hélène to... Uh, uh, just do a little bit of snooping around for George, and then she gives her a list of what she describes as the other 12. Well, if that other means 1 and you have 12, 1 plus 12 is 13. 13. So we see another possible um, uh, reference to the number 13 uh, here. And it's interesting that she gives this list to Hélène, who folds it up very properly and puts it in her little diary there. Uh, so what is going on here? Who is Georges? Why is Lily concerned about Georges? Why does Lily know about 12? Why is she writing 12 names on a piece of paper and giving it to Hélène? What does Hélène know? Who knows? What's going on? <laughs> Already, the seeds of mystery and conspiracy are being sown uh, with this little snippet. I have no idea what's going on, but it's utterly fascinating. Oh, gosh. And just continuing on with this thread, Marie, my goodness, what a surprise uh, the, the way that her character seems to develop. And I'll get to her in a second. But uh, later in the, in the work, we see her uh, acting. Uh, or you see her with the, the troupe and they're uh, rehearsing a scene and then they're getting together and she's so fixated on this idea of columns, you know, uh, the course should be represented by columns or something. And, and Lily in particular seems to be a little bit annoyed with Marie and there doesn't seem to be a bit of a, a connection between them. Uh, you note that I think that Marie seems to be... Um, being uh, brushed to one side almost. She's not really being taken seriously, which might be an, a continuation of that aspect of her character that we saw at the very beginning of the first episode. Remember when they were all doing their exercises? It was Marie who seemed a little bit off, right? Well, here in episode two, she is still, I think, a little bit off from the rest of the group. She doesn't seem to be quite gelling, as it were, um, which is very interesting. And she seems to be getting in the way with her yarn and her her knitting. Although that's an interesting uh, visual image itself, right? The yarn and the way it, it gets tangled up among the characters, right? Um, I think in a very subtle way that's tr supposed to be suggesting, perhaps, in a visual metaphor, the way in which a web is being formed, the interconnectivity between or among characters and a web, might we call it a web of conspiracy, who knows, but it's a great visual image. But Marie doesn't end there because I think earlier in the work, in the episode, we see her in her purple garb outside of a cafe looking through the mirror or looking through the window inside as she's looking on at the young man, the Jean-Pierre Leo character, doing his thing, again, bothering the customers, trying to get money, doing his thing with the harmonica. And when he leaves, there is that famous moment where as he's leaving, she comes towards him and she hands him a letter. Wow. Wow. So there is something going on with Marie. Why is it Marie who hands the young man this letter? What is going on with this letter? What, what is this letter supposed to mean? And in fact, this is just going a little bit ahead here. This is the first of three letters that the young man will receive during this episode. And so it's very intriguing that the first letter is handed to him by none other than Marie. And I would also note that she's looking on through the window quite, there's a kind of sinister aspect to the way she's looking on. It's, it's quite creepy, actually. So, yes, so who is Marie? What is she doing with this letter? What is going on here? And uh, why is she uh, looking at this young man the way she did at the cafe? So many questions are arising and, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, the mysteries are being developed. And finally, we I think we see the um, uh, 
uh, we see a solution to one of the earlier mysteries that was raised in the first episode. Who is Max? Right? Well, we see, I think, the character who is Max, who is this young man uh, who is referred to by Marie as Max, albeit very faintly. And he's walking into the theater or uh, to the, to the, um, the stage uh, floor. And uh, I think we un or think we're supposed to understand that he has a relationship with Quentin, and I think he is Quentin's son. Although I'm not quite sure of that yet, uh, but at, at least as far as the information that we have provided to us in this second episode, but I think he is the son of Quentin, and this is interesting too, right? Because. Uh, he has a certain rapport with the group, um, but he also mentions the fact that uh, you know he's not going to stay. So there is this thing about uh, Lily being very, uh, very um, um, uh, sensitive about having no strangers sit in and watch the rehearsal performances. And so I think uh, Max understands this. And so um, that's why he is, um, uh, that's why he is able to go out and, and you know, he wants to go to a movie, I think was a Once Upon a Time in the West. And uh, uh, speaking of Lily, this is the point where we see the young woman who might be the girlfriend of Nicola. I'm not sure, but this is Miss Blondish, right? And she comes in and she shakes everyone's hand rather, rather uh, comically or comedically. But uh, this is uh, then revealing the point that Lily doesn't like strangers watching the performances. And so she is then escorted out uh, with that little help from Max, as it were. Uh, but this brings up a, a great point about the Nicolas Arsenal character. After she leaves, the, they all ask him, well, how do you know her? And I think Nicolas responds, I don't know her. This is a very interesting point because this introduces the element that Nicolas Arsenal, Thomas, I'm sorry, Theo, Papa, he seems to have associations with people that he will then later say, he didn't know or he didn't know very well. This is true of Miss Blondish, and I think this will be true later on with another significant character uh, in a future episode. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, but anyway, this is very interesting. So, um, oh gosh, there's a lot going on. Okay, so then let's go to the fourth component of character here, which is very interesting, uh, the, before we move on to the final moments of the episode, which I think are also very fascinating. But let's go to the young man, the Jean-Pierre Leo character, and his stuff. Now, I should point out here, uh, there is a, a shot early on of him, again, doing the folding of the pages of, of um, the pages that he ripped out of a novel and folding them, putting them into the envelopes and licking the blue envelopes. This is reminiscent of the scene that we saw in the first episode where we saw him ripping out pages of, I think it was the novel La Banlieue, and taking each page that he ripped out and putting them in the envelopes and licking the, the envelopes. I would even dare say that it, it feels like the same exact scene. So uh, it, it, it might be suggestive of the same routine that he follows every single day but it also might be that thing that I was trying to focus on before which is playing with time the sort of temporal playfulness of this work that is uh, already uh, coming to the fore in this episode but of course what we have here with uh, the Jean-Pierre Leo character are the three letters and this is the start of the 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 propulsion of this work out one noli me tangere into the realm of conspiracy theory and the building of conspiracy theory within the universe of out one this is one of the most fascinating elements of this and uh, we should start with the letters themselves right because the letters that he receives there are three of them and i think what we have to remember is what are they talking about, what are their contents, and uh, what, it, what are these words that we will see this young man pour over, just look back and forth and back and forth and think so, so much on. What, are the, what is the focus of his attention uh, going forward with these three letters? Well, the first letter, which is the one that was given to him by Marie outside of the, or at the door of the cafe there, is, and please forgive me for my poor French pronunciation, 
but the first letter is Réunis le soir comme des conspirateurs, ne se cachant aucune pensée ou sans tout à tout d'une fortune semblable à celle du vieux de la montagne. Ayant les pieds dans tous les salons, les mains dans tous les coffres forts, les coudes dans la rue, leur tête sur tous les oreilles et sans scoop, which is translated into English by the Arrow uh, Blu-ray subtitles as gathered like conspirators who hid nothing from each other, enjoying a fortune similar to that of the old man on the mountain, with a foot in every salon, a hand in every chest, elbows in the street, their head on every pillow, and with no scruples. No idea what that means. Okay, but that's the first letter. Okay, then the second letter that he receives is, remember, he, he, we see a letter that's tucked under his door. And so we see him pick it up, and this is what we assume to be the second letter. And it reads as follows. Le lecteur, pendant quatre volumes de Souterrain et Souterrain, pour lui montrer un cadavre tout sec et lui dire en forme de conclusion qui lui a constamment fait peur d'une porte cachée dans quelque tapisserie ou d'un mort las par mes gardes. And pardon me for my poor pronunciation. Um, which is, the reader for four volumes from one underground passage to the next, showing him a dried out corpse and telling him as a conclusion that he constantly frightened him with a door hidden in the wallpaper or a dead man carelessly left behind. And then the third letter, which is quite cryptically and mysteriously flying through the air through the spiral staircase, and he catches it, and then he's trying to figure out who dropped this, but it, it, we don't know. But this this one is, De chemin souffrant, uh, I'm sorry, De chemin souffrant, uh, devant toi, treize pour mieux chasser le snark. Place-moi comme je dois l'être. Il n'aurait rencontre le bout. Sans foot notre ambition. J'aime qui les vies uh, s'évanouir à au port où tu dois aborder. Passer uh, le temps, passe le temps qui les goma humains guidera. La tienne d'autres treize en forme un étrange équipage. Équipage, équipage, équipage. This is translated into English as The paths lie open before you. Thirteen to hunt the snark better. Place me as I should be. They won't have met the boo. Holy was our ambition. Juni who saw them faint at the harbor where you must start. Spend the time that will erase them. A hand will guide your own. Other thirteens have formed a strange crew. So, this is the start of the, the great uh, montage, if you will, or the great sequence where we see him pouring over these words. What do they mean? What are the significance of these letters that are given to him under these very mysterious circumstances. What the heck is going on? There are linkages made to Lewis Carroll. There is also a profound eureka moment that this young man has when he's looking through one of the books that he has piled on against the wall. Balzac, yes, and he writes the number and he circles it. Trez. 13. Histoire des 13. This notion of 13 is becoming more uh, clearer and also at the same time more enigmatic. And this is the start, my friends, of something that's going to be great. This is going to be a great journey that we're going to be following through uh, uh, through the remainder of these episodes about one the Lima Tungara. We saw glimpses of this notion of 13 from the first episode, if you recall. Remember when um, uh, it was uh, they were talking about, um, you know, who is Mr. Furstenberg? Uh, he is, is he the short man with glasses? 
and uh, then he, uh, uh, it was uh, Arsenal Nicola Teo Papa who said, you know, um, is he the one who has the 13 volumes uh, of the prose by Wagner? Uh, so the number 13 was present there. We saw 13 kind of emerge earlier, remember, in the conversation between Lily and Elan when Lily writes the, the list of the other 12. And then now we have 13 uh, in the third letter appearing not once but twice. And we are meant to keep that in mind because remember, there's that memorable moment where he underlines the word treize with chalk. Uh, it's really wonderful. Um, so this is the start of something quite remarkable and little. so let's keep this in mind as we go forward with the rest of the series out one noli mitangere let me just conclude with oops, okay okay let me just let me conclude with uh, a number of just observations somewhat random observations and then we'll go from there and then also I'll conclude with the discussion of the last scene of the work which is I think very significant so before we go to the last scene I just want to say returning to the Thomas uh, Prometheus bound actors for a moment there is that great quite frightening sequence in the second half of the episode where we have Bergamot the young woman with the short brown curly hair she is seen on the floor uh, inert uh, seemingly uh, passed out or asleep or something. And then we have the entire troop, except for one, Fon, who is seen sitting cross-legged uh, alone against the wall. We see the other actors, though, reacting quite violently, sh noises, creating chaos, doing this thing, trying to, I don't know, almost act out the sense of aggression and almost um, violence. Perhaps the subject of their aggression and violence is, in fact, the sleeping bergamot. We then realize later that this is a kind of acting exercise meant, I think, to uh, have the actors act out their instincts and improv improvisational instincts with respect to acting out feelings of aggression. Also, at the same time, trying to re reinforce a sense of trust, you know, because these people are doing things that are quite physically potentially very dangerous. They put her on a stretcher and she falls off the stretcher and she's in a wheelbarrow and all this and there's banging of chairs and all this. So there's if, if something goes wrong, there's quite the possibility that she could get uh, very seriously injured, Bergamote. And so um, I think it's an exercise that's meant to generate a sense of trust among the actors, I think. But this is an interesting point that's raised in the discussion between or among the actors afterwards. And there are a lot of interesting things in this, by the way. So the first interesting thing is um, we see the young woman with the red hair, Fon. Remember, she basically sat out of this. She was sitting cross-legged by herself. And then she reveals that she, she, she's not sure how helpful this kind of exercise is because if it were her... It, w it was very difficult to act out feelings of aggression because she has the potential actually of lashing out in real flashes of aggression and violence. And so this is a very I don't know, frightening turn of this conversation. And it adds, I think, a layer of sinisterness, uh, a layer of danger to the proceedings of Out One Noli Matangare. This is further augmented by the fact that the way that scene closes is we have Rose, one of the actresses, Rose, who has the long blonde hair. We, she ends the conversation essentially by saying, you know, um, and I think she's referring to when she was subjected to that similar kind of acting exercise. She was saying how she was afraid that perhaps one of the other actors might lash out against her uh, you know, might have some kind of hidden aggression, real aggression against her, and she was really scared or she felt fear about that. If you watch this episode again, look at that moment and listen to the way that line of dialogue is presented. It's very interesting. It, it feels like a uh, post-synced line of dialogue. And in fact, when you look at the way Rose mouths the words, it doesn't quite match. It's not the it's not the actual recorded dialogue. It it's, it's feels like it's recorded afterwards. I don't know what the circumstances are. Uh, remember, this version of Out One 
was I think made or reassembled in 1990 around that time. It was then later restored in the early 2000, or, uh, 2010s, I think. Uh, and then the restored version was is the one that we see here. But uh, if you note that uh, in the documentary about the making of this, uh, Jacques Rivette in the archival interview says that there was some footage that uh, the sound was a li was destroyed and so there was a, some need to reassemble sound or recreate sound or dialogue. This might have been one of those moments. I'm not sure. I'm not the... Uh, um, I'm purely speculating. But my point is that it is very clear that that line that Rose speaks at the very end of this conversation is dubbed. It's dubbed over. What that does is, I think, not only does it have this suggestive, uh, this this suggestion that this work is a kind of pastiche, uh, a homemade thing that is being made as it's being presented, as it were, but that way in which that that line is overdubbed, it helps to emphasize that line above the entirety of that conversation and everything kind of dies down we see not her speaking for the uh, for the uh, the majority of that line but we see actually close-ups of Fawn and Achille uh, for some strange reason which is even further suggestive uh, it's that's suggestive to me that the 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 film and the the line maybe there's something faulty in it to begin with I'm not sure that maybe there was a need to do some for clever editing I'm not sure but I think the overall effect of that whatever the reason might have been the overall effect is that the way in which it's overdubbed gives emphasis to that line which then in turn creates even more sense of, of sinister air uh, there's something weird going on maybe there's some hidden anger that some of these people have maybe not who knows maybe this is much ado about nothing but if it isn't something that is more than nothing then it is indeed something that we should be concerned about because this is the first uh, real indication of the potential danger that lurks somewhere here another thing i should mention before i, I go uh, to the final scene is this notion that we see uh, one of those actresses beatrice we see a random shot of her coming through on the rooftop somewhere, and we see the Eiffel the fell in the background, and we see her talking to a, a kind of elderly gentleman who I think is identified in the, uh, in the credits as an ethnologue, an ethnologue. And so, um, you know, and uh, they're, they're trying to make plans to meet again. You know, they're a little bit busy. So, uh, you know, she comes there to say that she can't, she has, you know, she can't, uh, she doesn't have time to meet him, but maybe uh, they'll have time to meet the day after tomorrow or something. And, uh, and then she, he gives that uh, um, uh, Malagasy uh, uh, proverb, right? Um, I am the weed. Uh, by the roadside, not to trip you up, but to hold you back so we can talk. So there's something quite uh, romantic about that. And perhaps we can uh, take from this that there is a kind of romantic uh, feeling between these two. Who is this guy? I don't know. What, what, what's going on here? I don't know. There, there is yet again another sense of mystery and strangeness, another random element. Suddenly we are thrust uh, to this person. Who knows? And how, what, what, what was the time sequence too because this sequence happened in between the first sequence where they're talking around the, the the actors are talking about prometheus and the poetry and then the the sequence where they're doing the whole thing with bergamot and the whole lashing out the aggression exercise so the scene with the the ethnologue occurs in between these two now the 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 cushioning scenes right she's wearing like a, a, a orange red striped blouse or something in the scene in the middle where she's meeting the ethnologue on the rooftop she's wearing like a coat now i can of course maybe she's wearing the same blouse underneath that coat i don't know but it, it seems a little bit uh, interesting the way that uh, uh time and geography are being played out here i mean who is this guy and what's going on i don't know it, this is something that we'll have to keep in mind as we go along which brings me to the final part of this, which is the ending. And this is interesting too, right? Because after this, uh, we, after we see the Lily troop leave, 
she's they they are seen going down, which I assume is the metro, and then later we see Lily emerge from another station by herself. She goes then to, I think it's a line of taxis, and we see her approach one of the taxis. And then uh, sometime uh, soon after, we see the viewpoint of a car being driven. And then we see the car approaching what I think is a courthouse, I think. And then we see a, a woman that we've never met before ascending the, down the steps and then coming into the car and then uh, uh, sitting in the passenger seat. And we realize that it was Lily who was driving the car to the courthouse meeting this woman for the first time, who we understand from the credits as being Lucy. Um, so many questions from the outset. First, why did Lily, when she left the uh, train station, why did she go to the taxi only to end up driving a car by herself? I don't un quite understand what that means. Um, that's probably just a, a very random detail that I probably shouldn't be thinking about. But it, like, where did she get the car? Um, and she's driving. And uh, more importantly, I think for the purposes of the narrative, who is this new woman that we are meeting for the first time? She seems to be a woman that might be associated with the law. Maybe she is an attorney. There is talk about Georges. We see t we we get mentions of Georges, and so we understand that she sees Georges perhaps on a professional basis. And so we can assume, therefore, that maybe Georges and this woman, who is identified in the credits as Lucy, have to do with the law. Maybe they are attorneys. Okay, but it doesn't end there, of course, because there is a discussion here about Igor how Lily confides in Lucy, and the two, these two women haven't seen each other in a long time, but Lily confides to her that she saw Georges with Igor, and then Lucy says, that's not possible. How can, how can that have been Igor? That's not possible. If it was Igor, she would have known, which is already suggested of the fact that this woman, Lucy, seems to be more than meets the eye. She seems to be a woman that has some kind of knowledge which might be equivalent to some kind of power that she has or influence. Who is Georges? We still don't know. Who is Igor? We still don't know. But already we see snippets of Lucy and the reach of her knowledge in two key details in this scene. First, she says, Igor uh, visited you one day, didn't he? And uh, Lily kind of, uh, I think, silently assents, which might be suggestive of the fact that uh, maybe Lily and Igor had a little thing going on for a little bit, who knows. But Lucy knew about it. So she knew about this thing that probably was meant to be secret, who knows. But So that's one indication of the reach of Lucy's knowledge. Another indication, of course, is she says quite off the cuff, uh, you know, I, I'd love to see your performance one of these days. Of course, I will sit in the corner. I won't say anything. I don't want to interrupt. And then we get this immediate cut to a close-up of Lily's face. This is a very interesting moment, and it's quite profound. In uh, it, 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 it is very profound because remember we understand from their uh, from when they talk for the first time that this is the first time they're seeing each other in a long time, so they haven't seen each other recently. The idea that sh Lucy seems to know that Lily is sensitive to the fact that uh, she doesn't like strangers watching the troupe perform the rehearsals is suggestive of the fact that maybe Lucy really knows much more about Lily than Lily would be comfortable about, right? There are some things that Lucy really knows about that she really shouldn't know about there shouldn't be any reason for her to be able to know about that little detail unless she was doing some digging up on, on Lily, who knows. There is also mentioning of maybe we should get together again. It would be nice to get together again, but Lily seems to be a bit hesitant about that. And actually, before I continue, I should really take a step back, return to the conversation uh, with Thomas and Bergamot and Rose, and w when they are talking about the thing with uh, Bergamot and their aggression uh, acting exercise, I forgot to mention this, of course. Thomas mentions Lily and the fact that in the past there had been an incident where it was Lily who was performing the passive uh, Bergamot uh, role. She was passive, and then things went a little bit too far. and. Uh, she shed a tear, and this was not 
long before Toma and Lily broke up. At least that is according to Toma. So in that moment, we get a connection for the first time, I think, between Toma and Lily. Lily apparently had been in the same acting troupe with Toma, and according to Toma, they were probably quite romantically intimate, but they are not anymore. And this idea of Toma comes up again in this conversation in the car between these two women that closes the episode. Because remember, they're talking about Toma, how is Toma, and maybe we should all get together again. So there is some kind of connective tissue that is being created here. And it is augmented by this layer of, of, of um, mystery and a sinister mystery that was hinted at in the earlier conversations uh, about uh, uh, hidden aggression. It's also being hinted at by this mysterious character, Lucy, whom we know nothing about, and yet she knows everything, apparently, about Lucy, or about Lily, and perhaps she knows more than she's letting on. And this ends out one Noli Metangarer, deuxième the episode. De Toma a Frederick. Wow. Wow. So much going on here, my friends. And my goodness, it's it's amazing. So uh, what do you think so far? Uh, are you enjoying this? Is this a big waste of time? I don't know. Or is it something in between? I hope it's the former and not the latter, but it's okay if it's the latter. So don't worry because this is a very, um, this is, I think, a very uh, difficult work in many respects. So I don't expect everyone to like it, but I would be very happy to hear if you did like it. So if you have any thoughts or comments, of course, please feel free to leave your comments down below. I'd love to hear what it is you have to say about this. In the meantime, of course, uh, let us continue on with this work. So next time, episode three of Out One Noli Mi Tangerer. In the meantime, of course, please be happy and healthy and well. And please, please, please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Oh, and I forgot to say, the, the third letter that the young man receives, the word equipage is in red. I forgot to say that. That's very, uh, very important. We'll talk about that later. Uh, in the meantime, cheers. <laughs>